Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So you keep seeing all of these hacks and tips online, and some of them might sound a bit like old wives tales, and you want to know which ones to kind of follow and which ones to maybe give a miss. Now I'll talk to you through my experiences and also through some of my followers and subscribers experiences and I'll list through some of these hacks whether or not they're worth a try or whether or not maybe try something else. And this isn't extensive and I know that this is very personal to a lot of people. If you disagree with any of what I say in this, please do let me and everybody else know down below and maybe give some examples of how some of these things have or haven't worked for you. But there is another video that I did about this a while ago, so I will link that here at the top as well. But yeah, without further ado, maybe let's look at some of the hacks that possibly you should give a bit of a miss. This might be a bit of a quick and fast video because I do need to get through a very long list of these things. So I might dwell on some of these a bit longer, some of this a bit less, but right, let, let's dive into the kind of iffy ones. So one of the first ones, and this is an interesting one because this is something that people have been doing in gardening for a while, which is using things like eggshells. So you've got you boil some eggs in the morning or whatever, you've got some eggshells and you want to basically use crushed up eggshells and put it in the soil mainly, and I think the theory behind this is to add calcium into the soil. Now, this one's a bit of a mixed bag, at least from what I could see online. People might say, oh yes, I've been using this in gardening for a long time and it's done really well. Part of that reason is it depends on how much you crush the eggshells. So for instance, if you leave relatively large chunks, what you're also doing, especially if you're putting it within the soil rather than just at the top, you're actually adding some aeration to the soil by doing that because it creates that kind of uneven texture within the soil. So that is probably helping. Based on everything that I could see online, if those eggshell pieces are anything bigger than dust, they don't tend to absorb they don't break down into the soil enough to give it enough of a calcium boost as you might think by doing this hack essentially. So it's kind of an iffy one with this one. It might be one that, yeah, give it a try, but if you are gonna try it, do make sure that everything, the eggshell and everything is completely clean. You also don't wanna be adding food particles either on top of or beneath it in the soil because that might be attracting pests and ants and all these things and you probably don't need that within your house. Less of an issue if it's outside, but within your house you really don't want to be, you want to be avoiding that basically. But realistically the, the best way to get it down to the level that you might want to get it is to put it into something like a coffee grinder and you'd still need to mash up all of these eggshells and then blitz them into a powder and then arguably it's whether or not they're also bioavailable to the plant within the soil in that form because it's not pure calcium at that point. Pretty sure there's other chemicals within the eggshell as well. So it's a bit of an interesting one. And I will say this as well, there might be a more straightforward, and again, if you're on a budget, this might not apply to you, but use something like a fertilizer. I use, people that have been here for a while know that I do swear by liquid gold leaf. This is not an ad, obviously, but it does have, trying to see, yeah, it has got calcium in it. So some really, really good fertilizers or amendments to soil will have things like calcium already in it and it is in a bioavailable form. And by bioavailable, I mean, it doesn't need to break down any more than it needs to be. It's already available for the plant to kind of use that up and kind of live its best life. I'll move on to some watering hacks now. And this is a group of hacks and some of them might be better than others. So I'll start with the one that everybody is kind of always going on about. And I'm like, use your dryer, like condenser dryers, the water from there. Please don't use that <laughs> because there is likely going to be chemicals from the cleaning process of the actual clothes themselves that might still have particles within that soil and you really don't want to be adding that to your houseplant. So that one I'm going to poo-poo on relatively quickly. But the other one that people will also kind of say to do is use kind of grey water. That's even more dubious basically. So water that you might be using in your bath after you've had a bath. 
same issues with that one as well. Likely, unless you are literally sitting there in the bath without having put any soap in, which raises a whole host of other issues there. Uh, you really don't want those chemicals within that water to then be going into your plants. To be fair, even if you are literally just going into the bath without any other cleaning materials within that bath water, if you use lotions and stuff like that, they will probably dissolve into that water. And ultimately, if you use that water onto your plants, you are watering your plants, those chemicals. Maybe avoid doing that if you can. A few better options is obviously using something like rainwater from water butts. Not everybody has that option. I do appreciate the people that live in the big cities that might not even have a balcony in order to collect this water. This might not be an option for you, but for the people that do have gardens and they can get a water butt, you don't even need a water butt. You can put an empty bucket outside and it will eventually fill up with some rainwater and you can use that. There are other issues on that as well. So with a lot of water butts, what I found is you do need to condition the water because after a while of it been sitting there, depending on how much light is getting in, you might have an issue with algae in that water. So something else to remember. But another good option, and this is one that a lot of people do use on a regular basis, is fish tank water. Because fish tank water almost has extra nutrients from your plants from all the poop from the actual fish themselves. So it does work quite well. And I know people will swear by this. I don't know that much about that specifically. I don't know if there's some pitfalls that people might like to be aware of, but I am sure some of my subscribers or some of the people viewing this might actually use fish tank water and they might have something to say about it themselves. Please do let everybody know down below if there's any issues that you've ever found. I know that generally it's quite good and everybody swears by it, but if there's any issues that people might need to, if somebody's trying this for the first time, do let them know down below maybe what they need to keep an eye out for. Continuing with the theme of water, and I will come out of the water theme quite quickly, but I thought this is linked quite well, is the option of self-watering. So this isn't necessarily a hack, but, and this is not me touching on self-watering pots with reservoirs at the bottom that you're using either in semi-hydro form or anything like that. This is more kind of the, the quick hacks that everybody sees online of take a water bottle, put it upside down or drill holes in it, string it into the soil. With a lot of these things, you cannot control the speed of the water. And a lot of the times, say for instance, I'm using the example of an upturned water bottle that is being pushed down by gravity and it might be a bit too fast, especially if the holes are quite large. I have tried this even with the terracotta spikes that attach to a water bottle. Even that tends to seep out the water quite quickly. The reality with this, and I think my parents used to do this when I was growing up, it works in the sense of you haven't watered your plants, you're about to leave for the weekend or for a week and you're not going to be back and you do this so it can slowly, slower than you would just be watering your plants normally, um, water those plants over the next day, day and a half, but then it won't be getting any water until you're back a week later. It probably works in that respect, but for me, kind of looking back on it now, I'm just like, why didn't you just water that plant as normal and properly drench the soil and all of these things before you went away? You were basically achieving the same thing as rather than doing it slowly, correct me if you have different opinions. A slightly better option than this would be something like um, the wicking strings or rope or whatever they're called, where you put a water reservoir lower than where the plant is. And there is very specific, I think there are, I don't think it needs to be cotton, I think it needs to be synthetic, I might be wrong, correct me, because it's been a while since I've done my research and tried to do it myself. But um, you put one end of the wick in the water, the other end in the actual soil itself, not just on top of the soil, but in the soil you'd need to kind of get something like, I don't know, a chopstick or a, a moisture meter probe and just shove it in through with, with the, <laughs> this is going to be so bad, with the rope through the drainage holes so that it's within the soil and the root mass there and that will absorb water better and at a much more consistent rate basically without flooding your plant too much. So there is option A which might not be so ideal and option B which is a better option. It's slightly more involved in trying to get that set up but it is a slightly safer option, at least it has been in my experience. The next one that is still related to water but not necessarily a hack per se 
is bottom watering. So let me give you an example. So say this was a pot with a plant in it, it's very difficult for me to bring any of the plants down at the moment, but, and then you've got a saucer of, which would sit within it. As long as there's a bigger lip, what you would do is water the saucer, probably up to the top level, dip your plant in it. Some people like to take, if they don't have an awful lot of plants, they'll like to take this into something like a bathtub or a kitchen and fill up the sink and let the soil or whatever growing media is absorb the water from the bottom up. Now there's a few things to remember with this one. And I can talk from some level of experience with this because in the very beginning of my journey, I did do a lot of bottom watering. I didn't have as much as many plants. And that's one thing here is you do need to let the plants, even if they're in soil or anything like that, you need to let them sit in that water for a good 20, 15 to 20 minutes, basically, just so that they've got enough time to absorb. And you should be able to see at the very top level of the soil, if you put your finger on it, it should be a bit more damp at that point. Now, the tricky thing that happens here is this, and it kind of follows, the, the, the reasoning behind it is sound, is that in nature, yes, the plants will get rained on, so they'll get water flushing in through the roots, but there's also usually their roots might be getting close to a water level lower down within the soil and they can absorb it from there as well. So the theory is sound. Where it gets quite tricky is the execution in a household environment because the problem that you might get over there, and this is something that happened to me, is if you've got, um, usually say we're using something like a bathtub of water and you're sitting your pots in there so they can kind of do the bottom watering you're sitting all of your pots with all of their different soil media within that same water. Can you see how potential kind of cross-contamination could happen between pots? And especially if you're not refreshing that water for every single plant that you're doing, which then also leads to a whole wastage of water that you might be doing that way. There are just some things that you need to kind of keep in mind. And it's interesting because a lot of people I did a poll on my Instagram about some of the hacks and this one came up a lot. And I was surprised because actually my experiences were generally positive with this, but I did know to do most of these things. And I also gave up on it after a long period of time. I found that just regularly watering your plants the way that you would normally do with a watering can or anything like that generally is better. You get more even, mm, I mean, even with the bottom, bottom watering, it can be quite even. And sometimes you can't avoid doing something like bottom watering, especially if your soil has compacted because it's left to be dry for too long. That one for me, as far as I'm aware, the only way that you can potentially salvage some of that root mass is to let it sit in water until that growing media is fully saturated with water so it becomes a bit looser again. But bottom watering is a bit of an interesting one. There's a lot of people for and against it. I kind of sit somewhere in the middle and saying that it could work for some people. Staying on the theme of water and actually now going through my list, I've got my trusty iPad down below. I've realized that a lot of these hacks are related to water, which kind of makes sense because it's one of the things that you would generally do for houseplants. And this is a doozy. And I know I'm not the only one that has said this. Uh, this is a hack that has been around for way longer than it probably should do in terms of, I'm mean, guessing how many plants is probably killed. Do not please, for all love of money, put ice cubes on top of, usually this is a tip that's given for orchids, which uh, I will make the same comment that everybody else makes. These, a lot of these houseplants are tropical plants. Guess what they don't get in their natural environment? Any form of ice. This could shock roots. This, it's just not a good idea. The concept is, I kind of get where it's coming from in the sense that if you put an ice cube on, it will slowly melt, so it will slowly water the substrate. The risk that you run by it shocking the roots and causing other issues is just not worth it for me. Um, and again, this is one that I'd be really curious to see, and I might be triggering some people here. If you've used ice cubes for years and you've had success with this, please do let us know down below, because in my brain, it just doesn't make sense that it wouldn't eventually kill off your plants or it wouldn't shock them too much. So finishing off with, I think, one of the last watering tips and hacks kind of a thing, and this is one that I do encourage people to do, is change your propagation water often. As in, it, there's no such thing as too often. If you want to change your propagation water every day, change your propagation water every day. Arguably, most people won't do this. That also won't necessarily work if you've got a pothos cutting within the water propagation 
because if it's releasing that oxin and that kind of growth hormone within the water, if you're, rela if you're replacing the water too frequently, you're kind of negating what you're trying to achieve there by having the pothos cutting within the water. But generally speaking, if you're just propagating water on its own, the more you refresh that water, the better it is. Because essentially what is happening is those water roots are getting oxygen. Because remember, roots need to breathe. And I've done a recent YouTube video on root rot, so I'll link it at the top there as well. And with with that kind of notion, people were just like, but if you're propagating in water, everything is underneath the water. How is it breathing? It's getting that oxygen from the H2O molecule of water. So hydro, two hydrogens, one oxygen. And it's getting the oxygen from there. The problem with that then happens is if you've left the water stagnate for a long period of time, there is less of that oxygen available to the plant. At least that's the theory of it. So if you refresh that water, you're kind of adding more fresh water in with more oxygen molecules within that. And that's also another reason why a lot of people when they're doing the, the really kind of hardcore water propagators will have, I think, something called a bubbler at the bottom of their water propagations. And it just at, constantly is adding in oxygen. I think that is something that normally was used and is still used within uh, fish aquariums. So that is the theory behind that. It's, it's kind of injecting oxygen within that water media there. And I think a lot of people have great success with that. So definitely, definitely, definitely refresh your propagation water as often as possible. A lot of people have always asked me about my Monstera albos that tend to rot out quite quickly. For me, water propagation is still the better way of doing them with them. And they're just, how did you manage to not get it to rot out for you? Daily water changes when it's water propagating. It might take you a bit longer, um, but it was a much safer. I've never had an issue with any form of rot when I'm changing that water regularly. I mean, obviously there's other parameters that come into play there, but that I think for me is, is key is that you need to refresh that water as often as you can. Apparently I lied, there's more water hacks. So on we go. The other one, and it links into that kind of bottom watering method that we were talking about there is, and this isn't really a hack, this is something that people have been giving as advice for a long period of time, and it holds true for a lot of us. Water your plants thoroughly. So, and I think this is more of an issue when you're first starting out and you're trying to get your head around the hobby a bit more and how to kind of water properly is don't go, and I've had so many friends when they were first starting out, and it's a very valid question. And they just say, oh, I've used like half a cup because I don't want to drown it in water. No, you kind of want to do that. You want to take your watering can and water evenly around the entirety of the soil and the pot, basically, until the water runs out the bottom of the drainage holes. And I won't say the same thing that everybody else says, but I will say it at the same time. Always, always have pots with drainage holes. Um, and that generally means that the plant's roots, the root bowl, will get even watering over all of its roots. What you don't want to create is if you're watering very small doses like that, is some parts of that soil media will get wet and the roots will be okay there and other parts will dry out too, too much. And even that could lead to kind of root rot. I know <laughs> all roads lead to root rot. So underwatering can cause root rot because the roots dry out and then you water them and then uh, issues. Overwatering, you drown out the roots because they're not getting any oxygen, could lead to root rot. Uneven watering, in my experience, can also lead to root rot because it's usually on the drier side that that will happen. Because if you, if you, Say this is the pot and you're watering on this side all the time and not on this side. This is the bit that gets wet all the time and this is the bit that stays dry for a long period of time safe. Most of the time you water this side, but then one week you forget and you water this side that's been dry for a very long period of time and the roots probably on that side have dried out entirely. You've wet that. Can you see that it causes unevenness? So try to water thoroughly. The next big one on water is stop watering on a calendar. <laughs> and you still get this, and this infuriates me and a lot of other people when you are first getting into plants and you see the labels, and I get it, it it's a guide, and I understand why it needs to kind of be there when people are just like, water this every seven days, or once a week, or every two weeks. Each plant in each person's conditions are going to be different, and the people that have done this for a long time, they don't really ever pay attention to those things. What they will do is, and again, unfortunately this comes with experience, where they will say, okay, 
I'll water this to begin with once a week. And I'll see after the first week, is it drying out enough? Do I need to be watering it more frequently, less frequently? And eventually you'll get the balances to your specific plant in your environment and where you specifically have got it, how much water and how frequently does it need to be either fully drying out or almost fully drying out, things like that. And there is no fast and strong method of kind of saying yes. What you can do instead is kind of slightly try to reframe your brain, and I've mentioned this on a few other videos, and I use my favorite plant care app in that manner, rather than it reminding me when I need to water my plant, it reminds me when I need to check the moisture in the soil for my plants. And I've mentioned this again, and I always get so much flack for this. Moisture meters, they are not 100%, but when you're first starting off, it does give you some indication, and you need to take a measurement all around the pot, not just in one location, and not leaving it in all the time. Put it in, see what the measurement is, move it to another area, move, see what the measurement is, and do it around the pot a few times just to see that, get an average indication of what the moisture level is within the soil. And use something like a plant care app or something like that to kind of say, okay, once a week I will check and I will water accordingly. And the point where it will catch you out generally tends to be its seasonal changes. So I've mentioned this on a previous video as well, where Usually if you're going from summer, and especially here in the UK where autumn is a bit of a myth, we go from summer to winter basically. There's like a few hours of autumn or a few days of autumn, it's not. <laughs> um, so you might go from, uh, I can give an example in here, I went for some plants that were getting watered every two or three or four days, all of a sudden within a week, they would just like, oh, you now need watering every 20 days. So you need to keep that in mind, so that's why you can't say even your plant in your environment and your conditions with the care that you're giving it will still need different watering habits at different times of the year for you to get optimal growth, basically. So um, Monstera deliciosa that you've had and you're watering it once a week or once every two weeks, in the winter you might then have to be watering it once every four or five days in the summer to really keep it going and being healthy. So. <laughs> clear as mud. But yeah, try not to do it on a calendar. Try not to water on a calendar. Try to check your moisture levels on a calendar. That's a slightly better way of doing it. And as I said, I do understand for really kind of newbies, they need that kind of hand-holding in the beginning to at least start somewhere. But I mean, even with people that are just starting off, try reframing your minds a bit in that way. So maybe go with what the plant pot was saying if it's once a week water it, and a week later, instead of just watering it blindly, just check it really quickly and see, is it, does it need the water? If not, just let it for a few days and eventually you'll kind of get there going, oh, actually no, that plant, in my conditions at this time of the year, probably needs it about every 10 days. And still check before you water it, but yeah, that's a, that's a safer way of doing it. The next little tip, and it's kind of related to water, is pot feet. And this is interesting because a lot of people might use these in balconies and gardens, but not a lot of people make that connection that it can also be used in a houseplant environment. And hopefully I'm inserting a video over me as I'm talking here to give you an example of how I use them and they have been a lifesaver, especially for my larger plants in larger plant pots, necessarily just within terracotta, but in bigger plastic pots as well, because big plants with a lot of soil in them, with a lot of plant on top of them can get quite heavy. So having that plant pot sitting in a drip tray can be quite tricky when it comes to wanting to flush that pot fully. So actually using these terracotta is usually the ones that I found, either coated terracotta, glazed terracotta, or kind of raw terracotta, and you put it underneath the plant pot and then you just water freely as long as you've got a big enough and a deep enough drip tray underneath it, then that water won't that plant pot won't be sitting in that water, that large volume of water, and it will just be at the bottom of that drip tray. And it leads me in quite nicely on the other tip that I use that's been really kind of useful of two things. And apologies in advance for both how scruffy these things look. One, and this might surprise people, a turkey baster, and this does need, I'm aware that both of these things will need a clean. <laughs> um, a turkey baster, and essentially what you would do is in a big drip tray, if it's full of water, you would put the turkey baster in and basically 
suck up that water and kind of dispose of it or do with it what you will at that point. But it's an easy way of emptying out those drip trays. This isn't just for the pots that have got the plant pot feet in them. This is also for even more so for the pots that just sit straight onto the drip tray because a lot of times you get that you, for all your best intentions, you would never be able to measure it fully and some of it might be sitting in water and then you'd have to lift the pot, take the drip tray out, move it and do all these things. It's not always an option with the bigger plants. So something like this is a godsend. It's weird and people, whenever they come into my space here with the plants, are just like, why have you got a turkey baster? And I explain it to them and they're just like, ah, oh, that makes sense. And I was like, mm. They're not that massively expensive. This is just a plastic you want. As I said, it does need a bit of a clean. The other thing that I tend to do as well, especially for bigger plants in bigger drip trays where you might get like a river of water sitting or like a lake of water sitting in that drip tray, is using these things. And they're, they're just siphons, basically. I think they're meant to be used for other things, but essentially you put this end into the drip tray with the water in it, you kind of pump it up the top, it pulls up the water, and then this end needs to go into something like a watering can of kind of used water, and it will siphon it out. That's This is a faster way than the actual um, turkey baster, they pretty much do the same job, this just does it a bit faster because I still use the turkey baster with the big, big pots and the big, big um, drip trays. I can take a while of you sitting there and doing this all the time, this will do it a lot faster. <laughs> Efficient. Shockingly, I'm looking at the list, I think that's all the watery hacks and this has already been quite a long video, just the water hacks, but I'm gonna power through, this might be a long video. <laughs> Just, I'm trying to go through it as fast as I possibly can, so bear with me. But um, the next big one, and I'm looking at the list, is something called diatomaceous earth. I cannot talk about it from experience. I will tell you what I have heard from people that have used it. And this is another one that's a bit of a, it could work, it could not. It depends. People have mixed experiences with this. Essentially what diatomaceous earth is, and I'm not entirely 100% sure what it's, kind of chemical composition is, and I'll try to add it up the top there, it looks essentially like sand. And it's almost, think about it as very, very tiny glass fragments. And you would put this layer of sand over the top of your soil. This is mainly to treat uh, fungus gnats, so those things that look like fruit flies that are buzzing around your plants that are kind of living in that kind of top layer of the soil because they like a really damp moist environment and that's where they would lay their eggs in as well. The theory is that it won't deal with the adult flies, but it will deal, yeah, it can deal with them if they, they usually have to bear, burrow into the soil to lay their eggs so they can get shredded as they're going. It sounds horrible, but it, <laughs> they get shredded by these tiny glass fragments as they're going into the soil. So that could kill the parents off, not as quick as the, the kind of larval stages when they try to emerge from the soil and they get shredded coming through that diatomaceous earth. As I said, I've never used it because if I'm not mistaken, it's still relatively pricey here in the UK and I would imagine maybe Europe as well. I'm assuming, I see a lot more of my American followers using this. I'm assuming it might be a bit cheaper where you all are than it is here. And I know some people have had good success with this and some others, it didn't really work for them. For me, what has always worked really, really well is using something like beneficial nematodes. And these are little tiny worms that will, you kind of use them in the water, you drench the plants as you would normally do, and essentially they hunt out the, the larval stages. Again, this doesn't deal with the adult flies. The only thing that really deals with the adult flies is the yellow sticky traps, which are horrendous, but yeah. Um, the beneficial nematodes essentially think about it as little worms and they go and essentially eat uh, eat the, the larval stages of this. So, and I have had great success with this. In the beginning, when I still suffered a lot from fungus gnats, I can say that since doing these drenches for a couple of years, I've never really had a problem with fungus gnats since then. I do this once a year, usually when it's spring moving into summer, drench all my plant pots, done, I don't have to worry about it for another year. And yeah, it's quite good. It does take a while for it to start functioning, but yeah. So diatomaceous earth is, is a hack that's a bit of a could work, could not work. It depends on your situation. Another one that's kind of, and one that I mentioned recently in another video, again, when it comes to root rot, is using hydrogen peroxide to deal with kind of root rot 
areas. And essentially, as I mentioned there, there is a free version of this and you can just let it air dry because essentially what the hydrogen peroxide is doing is killing off some of this bacteria and fungi that need it to be anaerobic, so not any oxygen or air, and just by exposing these things out to the environment, put it by a fan maybe and let it blow some air on there, will do the same thing and it will probably be cheaper overall. And a lot of people were very kind and they did answer the question that I had on that video. Yes, apparently it's a lot cheaper in America and Canada than it is at least here in the UK. I, don't, I can't claim it to know the price in Europe, but yeah, over here I'm just like, eh, it's expensive. I don't really want to be like shoving all my plants in this. So yeah, it's it does work, but do you really need to be using the chemical if you can just do it for free? If it gives you that sense of kind of crazy mad scientist and I'm doing something and I'm seeing that kind of reaction, by all means, please do it. It won't necessarily harm your plants. I'm not the biggest fan of dousing a plant that's already in soil with hydrogen peroxide. That, that one worries me a bit, but even if it is kind of diluted, but for treating root rot after you've kind of unpotted everything uh, kind of makes a bit more sense to me. But yeah, it's a bit of a love it or hate it with this one, but it, it does theoretically work. The other one that came up when I was asking kind of followers to kind of say about which of these hacks they don't think work is interesting because they came up with neem oil. And I've been using neem oil for years and it does generally tend to work. It, I will caveat this and say it works best with when I do a neem oil solution with soap and water and spray it for spider mites. And that's the only thing that I have found neem oil to work well for me. But theoretically, yes, I kind of get what they're talking about. You can get, is it horticultural oil? Essentially, it's that it doesn't need to necessarily be neem because neem also smells so bad. It can be any form of oil in theory, because essentially what that oil is doing is coating the outside of these pests and essentially suffocating them, if I'm not mistaken. It kind of causes issues within their life cycle. But in theory, any oils could do it. It doesn't necessarily need to be neem oil. The theory behind neem oil, I think, it is that it will also deter rather than just kill at the same time. Whether or not it deters, it's more of a, not necessarily kill on impact, but kill a few days later. Uh, but is it, it's not the same thing as a systemic, which is a much more chemical kind of process where you'd spray a plant down and that plant, you do it again after a couple of weeks time and that plant itself is protecting itself because of those chemicals in the systemic spray, in the systemic spray against pests. Neem oil doesn't necessarily do the same thing with me, so I get why some people might say that this is a hack that doesn't really work for them, but kind of half busted with this one. I don't know. It kind of works and it kind of doesn't work. It's a bit of a weird one, but tell me, I know a lot of people will probably have opinions about this one. Do share them down below. Right, another one that keeps coming up all the time is adding cinnamon to when you take a cutting, for instance, to propagate, or even when you're trying to deal with kind of any kind of bacterial or fungal thing, even with root rot, a lot of people will say add cinnamon powder. This is an interesting one. And I haven't dived as much as some of my followers, and I know all of you like to geek out about this as much as I do. I haven't dived into it as much as you all have, but I know it's the, the theory behind it is that cinnamon has got kind of antifungal, anti fungal and antibacterial qualities. So if you put it over, say, you take a cutting from a plant and it's the, the exposed cutting on both the cutting that you've taken and the mother plant, you could kind of like dab it with cinnamon. Some other people also use uh, charcoal. I think the, the theory is the same there. And it kind of stops the bacteria from growing there. The research for some of this, and there's been a lot of chatter online that I could see, is that it needs to be a very specific, I think, Ceylon um, cinnamon, which is really, really expensive. And the standard cinnamon is different that you would get in the supermarkets, the cheap stuff that you would get in the supermarket. So it doesn't necessarily always work. The experiences that I've heard from those people is that it does an okay job, actually. I don't think it necessarily is a bad thing. The the question that I have to all of you that have tried this, have you ever had an experience where you've used it and it's gone horribly wrong? So the, 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 
the concept that I'm trying to establish here is if somebody was to use it, would it be risky, as in definitely don't use it like ice cubes because it's definitely going to lead to some issues further down the line, or try it at your own risk and it's probably, nothing bad will necessarily happen, but it might not work in the way that you expect it to work. Do you see what I mean? It's it's not going to be a detriment to the plant. It could be something that you try, but do do let us know down below. On a similar note, honey and using honey to coat a cutting before you put it in soil because again antibacterial antifungal situation there and then kind of trying to propagate from there. This is an interesting one because yes honey does have those qualities to it. A lot of the rooting hormones do that as well so the predominant kind of thing within rooting hormones especially the powders that you might add into your cuttings is mainly to avoid that kind of rot out situation just to give that plant the best chance of success. Yes, it does have some hormones in there as well. People do claim that apparently the honey does the same thing. From what I found, it's mainly that the honey is that got that notion of coating something with antibacterial and antifungal, similar to the cinnamon, but I would imagine because it's more of a syrupy consistency that the theory is that it would stay on that cut end a lot more than say cinnamon would be if you're sticking it into soil. For me, this is, I've never tried it, but I would be, I don't necessarily want to be adding honey into any kind of growing medium. That, that would worry me basically, just mainly for ants. Um, but do let me know what your experiences have been. I don't necessarily think that it would necessarily cause any problems with your plants, but I've not tried this. It sounds a bit hicky to me. Tell me about what you found with this. So I'll end with two hacks that are a bit more on the positive side and they can help your plants because a lot of people will just like turn your plants. Spoken about uh, etiolation previously when a plant will lean towards the light, especially if you've got a window in front of the plant and the plant is here for instance, it will start leaning towards the light and the concept of turning the pot slightly every time you water is that you will get uniform growth going up rather than it leaning towards the side. I don't think this needs to be debated anymore. This is true, like most people have tried this and it does work. Whether or not we all remember to do it is a different story altogether and we all do have some of these plants that lean, even with our best intentions. <laughs> and the last thing I will say, and this is for everybody, not just the newbies, because some of us that have been doing it for a while forget this as well. Buy a plant for the space that you've got for it. And by that I mean don't just get a plant because you want a plant, but you cannot give it, it the conditions that it needs to thrive, and then you get disappointed when it all goes a bit wrong. And this cannot be more true with people, and no hate to the people that buy plants, mainly as decorative elements, but if your modus operandi is, I'm going to get this plant because it's going to look so cute on this cabinet here, but that cabinet there doesn't get any light or it's right above the radiator and it's going to be dry all the time. And then you wonder why that plant has dried out. Buy the plants if you know you can give it the space that it needs to grow and thrive. Or if you're buying really common house plants and you want to use them almost a bit like cut flowers, yeah, do that do that. Use them as cut flowers, use them as decorative. You're aware that it's going to die out and you might need to replace it in a few weeks or months time, that's fine. But if you want to get a plant that will truly thrive, the location that you give it needs to be relevant to the plant and not what you want to give it, if that makes sense. So hopefully that makes sense. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed this as a bit of a random video, but the last time I did one of these kind of come talk with me and have a chat with me about plant hack videos. It did, you guys all really seem to have enjoyed it quite a bit. If you like this, this can become its own series as well. Do let me know and let me know some of the hacks that I might have not have covered in the comments down below and I'll talk about them the next time around. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.